Hello and welcome back to another episode of Sounds Japanese Canadian to Me, Stories from the Stage. I'm your host, Kunji Ikeda, and thanks for tuning in as we welcome stories from Japanese Canadian artists from across Canada to take a look at our shared culture and identity. I am honored to sit down today with Tetsuro Shikamatsu, a playwright, actor, and trailblazer, as he was the first visible minority to host a daily program on the CBC radio. I welcome you back to the Nikkei Theatre within the mind. Now take a moment to settle into your seats. Feel that electric energy of the pre-show atmosphere. And if you're ready, let's take a deep breath and get to some stories. Lights up on Tetsuro Shigematsu. My name is Tetsuro Shigematsu, and these are my stories from the stage. Hello, Kunji. This is me taking a bow, full seiza to you and your esteemed audience. Thank you so much for having us. Please, wh where are we on our stage? What's, what have we got to adorn our, our conversation today? Well, right now, it's uh, you and me hmm. uh, kneeling on a tatami. Uh, on some uh, on some cushions it looks a little bit like uh, rakugo uh, mm -hmm. two sort of comic japanese storytellers and we're very resplendent in our kimonos and in yukata you can decide mm -hmm. who's wearing what <laughs> and yeah our audience is sitting comfortably uh in the cool darkness there is no light upon them but we can sense their rapt attention mm -hmm. and yes uh, and there is a bottle of warm sake between us oh beautiful absolutely i mean uh, and and audience we we also have the option available to you if you so choose to uh, uh if they're brave them. enough to reach forward and uh and grab a cup then <laughs> can be very impressed that they did so <laughs> beautiful all right, well welcome to this stage tetsuru uh can you give us a, a quick introduction who you are what you do in this artistic world of ours well, in my so-called career, I've been a lot of different things, but primarily at the present moment, I'm known as a theater artist. I have had the pleasure of touring two uh, different parts of Canada with my solo work called Empire of the Sun, which is spelled S-O-N, which is the autobiographical story of my relationship with uh, my father. And uh, this year I was slated to tour with another solo work called One Hour Photo, which is the story of Mass Yamamoto and his life story, which began with uh, incarceration, uh, of course, right after Pearl Harbor. And so, uh, and since then, uh, because of the success of those works, I produced, I wrote and uh, had another play called Kuroko, which was about a young Japanese woman who was hikikomori, uh, an extreme shut in, mm. and that was set in Tokyo. So, yeah, that's me. I'm a playwright performer, um, but unlike you, not a dancer. So a little, <laughs> little less impressive. Well, I mean, now I'm, I've been given the mantle of trying to, to equal your, your wit and charm. And, and I don't know if I'm up for that, but with this sake, I, I, I might hope to hold a candle. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully the sake will, will loosen you up a bit because oh, you're such an uptight guy, Kunji. I know that's your reputation <laughs> you know, with your long flowing hair and your, your gorgeous physique and your, your handsome <laughs> visage, yes. Oh goodness! Uh, now, now tell me, a lot of these works stem from your your heritage as a Japanese Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a well there to draw from. Uh, is that is that fueling kind of is that fueling your artistic life right now? Well, it's true. A lot of my work is of an autobiographical nature, and. I guess part of that autobiography, of course, is my cultural background. I, I find I think the two are inseparable. Uh, when I was a, a host on CBC Radio on a program called The Roundup, mm -hmm. I was on air every day for two hours. And when you spend that much time with your audience day in and day out, there's actually not very many places you can hide as a person. So 
I leaned into that challenge and I drew heavily upon my personal life. Not so much because I was inclined to do that, but I think as a storyteller and having that public position, I just knew strategically that whenever you can talk about your own family, your own experience, that's a really efficient way to capture audience interest because even if you are inclined towards being discreet as I am, and even if you're naturally an introvert, an introvert again, as I'm inclined to be, I just found that being able to talk about the conversation I had with my partner or my kids or my parents, that was just a really quick and easy way to enable the audience to feel close to you. Hmm. I mean, that really resonates in a lot of your work that it, it feels like as we watch a piece with you or, or watch, uh, listen to an interview with you, we're, we're getting to know you as, as the person. Yeah. And I think that's always a delicate balance because in my show, for example, Empire of the Sun, it's, there's a lot of emotional territory that I'm traversing. And one of the epiphanies I've been able to arrive at is that people assume when your name is Tetsuro in the program and the character you're playing on stage is also named Tetsuro, they assume that that's who you are. And I think that occasionally it must be disappointing for people to realize, or when I try to impress upon them, because they're reluctant to believe this, that I'm actually not the same person that you just saw on stage. I'm not, A, I'm not that smart. I'm not that, I'm not that stupid either. Um, I'm not that, I'm just a lot less interesting. I'm like, if this, if real life me is a, is a, is a photograph, what I'm presenting on stage is a kind of sumie caricature. Mm, just you've got the filter on. Yeah, and that, that filter is high contrast and yeah. it's entertaining and I spend 75 minutes on stage and you think you you know me and of course it's, you, you know me as well as you can know anyone in 75 minutes. But really, I think some of the expectations people have of me after the show, uh, I think some of those expectations are misleading. Ooh. It's interesting uh, because who you are on stage uh, is not, of course, who you are in real life, but you, you must experience this yourself. Absolutely. Uh, hearing you speak about the high contrast version, um, being able to script all of my certain interactions in order to lead someone down a path of a narrative uh, is, is yeah, having that character who is in a lot of ways who I aspire to be. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I hope to be that uh, insightful at every turn of the road, but it's, it's just not who I really am. At least not yet. <laughs> yeah, Jerry Seinfeld said about his own stage persona, or TV persona, he said, it's me, uh, only better. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that uh, that's an illusion we present mm. to the audience. But I tend to think of theater as a kind of metaphysical pageant show in that part of the reason why we do art is to enable people to see that part of ourselves. I think mm. theater artists and dancers, we have this kind of magic trick whereby we can pull ourselves inside out or, you know, yank on our internal chain and illuminate ourselves. This is a a really marvelous trick. And I think the, you know, part of the reason why we art was invented is because we cannot read each other's minds. But if you notice, and no doubt you've had this experience yourself, after you do a show and if it goes well that evening or matinee, then you are beset by people who want to know you, who want to be connected with you, who, who feel like you, you're a kindred spirit. And that's, that's really wonderful because for me, again, as someone who's inclined to be shy, I find that this is a really elegant way to bring many people towards you. It's, 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 it's great to be that, that source of light mm. that others are drawn to. That's a beautiful kind of summation of that illumination. And, and so uh, can you speak about how this 
ability to to illuminate those parts of yourself and and show those ha- have offered you something in your non-stage persona yeah um i think one of the things we learn as performers is how to be private in public and i think the moment of performance is to draw a magic circle whereby the rules of the outside world are temporarily suspended. Uh, the poet Rumi has this wonderful verse, beyond all right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, meet me there. And when we're in the moment of performance and all those rules are suspended, there is a kind of zero gravity that's possible. I heard, you know, the Nick art, uh, the the recording artist, Nick Cave, um, he talks about how when he's on stage performing music, he becomes a kind of, he becomes the type of person who believes in God, which implies off stage he doesn't. And so I think what is possible on stage is a greater range of possibilities. And I think that can't help but affect what happens in everyday life. I think the, the, the corollary I would make is maybe meditation. Mm-hmm. So there's cushion work and there's off the cushion. And I found that by opening myself up emotionally uh, through the course of performing, for example, my show like Empire of the Sun, where I, I relive the death of my father night after night when I'm on tour. Uh, that has enabled me to cry in real life, which was something I wasn't able to do prior to doing the show. Mm. So I find that the constraints of masculinity are less binding as a result of the greater emotional territory I'm able to roam uh, within during the course of a 75 minute performance. Similarly, that magic circle is is such a powerful, um, it's a superpower. Uh, being able to, to recognize that when we're in this theater, when we're together communing and able to think together, breathe together, uh, live together as, as we are right now in the theater of the mind, uh, there's so much more possibilities of connection. Uh, for example, my my performance, Sansei the Storyteller, uh, opened up conversations with my aunt and my uncle that I was I I was pretty sure they were off limits. I didn't think I'd ever get to understand certain things about my aunt and uncle until I offered them the opportunity to speak for an art project. And all of a sudden, we're having these deep, thorough, intimate conversations of their experiences, of their lives. And then to recognize that that circle is possible with pals. I mean, friends and and not necessarily for an art project, but but that same ethos, that same feeling can is, is tangible, whether we're in a rehearsal hall or whether we're meeting someone for the first time. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's really remarkable how the nature of our work uh, can can continue to mold us uh, outside the rehearsal studio or in in the rest of our life. I think that's a real gift of of being an artist. Uh, and so, by offering up your own vulnerability, um, people feel that much more willing to to offer you the same gift. Mm hmm. And as you spoke about uh, it, it being a, it allows us to mold in a certain way. I really love that image. Um, recognizing that that this artistic work allows us to to be molded or allows us to connect with audiences in a certain way or connect with ourselves. Do you see the experience of being a Japanese Canadian performer to be unique or have a certain a certain set of invitations? Uh, that may not be available to every performer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's one thing to be a person of color on stage, um, but I think the Japanese diaspora, we bring a unique 
uh, set of cultural baggage in that there aren't many people out in the, out in the world who aren't familiar with some aspect of, of Japanese culture, be it uh, Kurosawa films, samurai, ninjas, sushi, what have you. And <laughs> when I was on tour with Empire of the Sun, I visited parts of the country where I couldn't reasonably conclude that I was the first Asian man they'd ever seen on stage. Wow. And sometimes, you know, I come out on stage and I'm wearing my wooden getta and uh, the stage setting itself is austere and I begin with a bow and the first words out of my mouth are in Japan. So I noticed that inadvertently in that context, I had immediately positioned myself as other it really, I think, was a visceral surprise to them to the degree that I felt like sometimes the audience was almost leaning back, like, whoa, what, what is this? But, you know, by the time I nail that first joke a few minutes in, <laughs> by the time we go through a lifetime together within 75 minutes, you know, someone uh, once told me that at the National Arts Center, all my life, I've always walked past the door of the House of Japanese Culture, but this is the very first time I felt like I was invited in, uh, into the house. And, and he mm. said, thank you for that gift. And it's true that the Japanese aesthetic is such, there is a kind of widespread universal love for all things Japanese, but as for hearing the experience of a family that comes from Japan, immigrates to Canada, and how we are just as broken and dysfunctional as, as everyone else, <laughs> that's a level of familiarity that I think is really new for uh, Canadians. And so like many people, they think you think you know Japan, but when they encounter artists like you or like me, they're, they're getting a whole different level. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really nice discovery for them. Mm. Can you feel, can you speak about the weight that comes along with being a lot of people's first interaction with this sense of other? In Edmonton, I was performing at the Citadel Theatre and we couldn't figure it out, my stage manager, Susan Miyagashima and I, because the audience would be completely silent throughout the whole show. And yet they would give us standing ovations at the end. So it, they were into it, but <laughs> they were just completely silent. And one night I come out and I see an Asian man sitting at the front table and he's just giving me the most beatific smile. And I look down at him and I, my heart for some reason just opens up and I just give him the biggest smile back. Like we're having a moment. And then I began the show and that show unlocked it. Everyone laughed. Huh. Everyone responded. And I only found out later, this man was actually my cousin, whom I hadn't seen in 25 years. Whoa. Uh, so I didn't physically recognize him because his hair had turned gray. And I recognized him as a, you know, I remembered him as a young man. Hmm. But we had this moment uh, whereby, you know, our hearts connected, my heart chakra, you know, opened up. And it opened up to everyone. So I realized without changing the script, before I say my first word, when I walk across the stage, I have similar moments with people in the audience. I don't say anything, but I smile and I nod and I let everyone know non-verbally that I'm your host. This is my living room. You're going to have a good time. I'm gonna make sure of that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little bit of back and forth. And then once the audience understood the rules of engagement, hmm. because again, many of them perhaps had never seen someone like me on stage before. That was my sense. I could be wrong. Uh, then everything changed. You know, if I were earlier in my career, I would have, you know, when I was Milton, I thought like, like all those, these rural Canadians, they're just so close minded. You know, they're, <laughs> They're probably prejudice against me, but no, it was on me as a performer to figure out where they're at and how I could meet them there. I come from uh, Samurai heritage uh, on both sides of my family, but there's also some uh, geisha 
in my family tree. Ah. And I feel like they are my spiritual mothers much more than the samurai. Because if you put a sword in my hand, you know, in the, you know, 16th century, I'd have been a dead man. You know, I have the worst mm. eyesight. I just, it's amazing to me that, <laughs> you know, we have, we found other ways to be useful to the, to the different clans as scholars and, and what have you. But I do feel like the geisha uh, or the courtesans um, had to cultivate an exquisite awareness of their patrons. And mm. I feel like it's incumbent upon artists to have that same level of that desire to, uh, to be aware mm. and to respond in kind you know, with song, with dance, but always having a sense of where is the audience at and how can I, how can I work with that energy? That's lovely. Um, but something I'd like to ask you that, uh, that you mentioned there is um, recognizing that we as performers ha have work to do to, to welcome our audiences in, into the space, into the theater. And is that work that we have to do that white performers don't have to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember the very first time I saw an Asian actor on stage. Uh, it was, I think, maybe the first piece of theater I ever saw, National Theater School. And all the actors were white. And I noticed, oh, this person doesn't belong. Uh, it was a female uh, actor and she was pretty good, but I thought, you know, obviously she doesn't have much of a career ahead of her. Uh, that person, of course, was Sandra O. Oh. oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, it's funny during the early days of um, when so-called girl bands were a novelty, hmm. uh, a lot of people who objected to them the most were female audience members. It just struck them as weird. And I think that's an interesting example of a kind of internalized uh, racism or sexism. And I think that the hard work that often marginalized people have to undertake is to decolonize our own imaginations. Um, there is an actor in our community who's extremely talented and every time I see him on stage I always think man I'd love to write and direct a movie that would be a vehicle for you because I think that would do really well for the both of us and but then I always thought myself I think how come I never have that thought about a non-white actor this actor happens to be white mm. and so again it, it shows the limitations of to what degree I've been inculcated with white supremacist ideals there comes a point for a lot of marginalized people of color or differently abled queer artists where we have to say, pick me, or we have to be the ones who say, you need to come see my show because it's about me and my community. So I don't think white artists, A, they don't have to, it's not a mental leap for them to picture themselves on stage, on screen, because you know you stand in the line at the grocery store and all those magazines, you know, people, us weekly national Enquirer. it's they're all white faces except for oprah right thank god for oprah but <laughs> you know when you look into the collective mirror that is culture white people can always see people who look like them that's not this that's not true for us we're like vampires we look in the mirror and we don't see our reflection it's a weird phenomenon mm -hmm. and so until we pass through the looking glass and and, and take our positions uh, you know, that in itself is, is such an act of defiance and resistance. Even giving yourself permission to attempt that, that in itself is, is such a huge victory. So, yeah, I think there is no doubt that um, there are many obstacles for marginalized people, uh, people of color. Uh, but what's so insidious is that most of those obstacles are deeply embedded within our own thinking. Absolutely. Uh, going through school, uh, I don't think I was ever given the opportunity of a lead role. And, and I also, in the same way, didn't see myself in those roles. And it wasn't until I started writing for myself that, that I could step into those challenges of, of things that I really wanted to uh, try in my life. And, and in a similar way, 
running up against these really embedded preferences to people who didn't look like me. What was your process in recognizing? And where are you now? What was your process in recognizing those within yourself? Well, like many people of color, I underwent a similar uh, set of stages in terms of my awareness about my cultural background. I, I grew up thinking I was white for a long time. <laughs> Me as well. I used to have this recurring dream that when I looked in the mirror, it was the Fonz from Happy Days. <laughs> Uh, looking back at me. So uh, clearly I had a good self-esteem. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't actually realize I was Asian. And I think a lot of people of color don't realize that they're not white until they have this this, this sort of disassociative mode when someone points out that, no, 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 you're, you're different. You're, you're, you're not one of us. Or For me, I went through that stage, but something that was very pivotal for me was in my early 20s, moving to Japan. And living within a culture that had its own galaxy of Japanese stars, where the standard of beauty wasn't by default white, where you had, you know, uh, the Japanese Cary Grant, you had the Japanese Dwayne Johnson, you had the Japanese you know, Catherine Deneuve, you had all these equivalents. And by realizing that, oh, there is a world beyond the parameters of, of, uh, of white supremacy was really eye-opening. And then learning to find other Asians attractive and for those Asians to find me attractive. That, that was huge. I was only in Japan for two years, but it really changed my life. And I think that uh, being on the radio for mm. two years... Uh, was kind of a subversive way to learn about myself, but also for to have Canadians learn about me. My predecessor, Bill Richardson, I think for many Canadians, uh, he was their first gay friend. Hmm. Um, and that's huge. And I think for when I followed in his footsteps, I was for many rural Canadians, many other Canadians, I was their first Japanese Canadian friend. And I think part of what helped was the fact that I was born in London, England. English is my first language. You know, you and I, we sound white. And that may be embarrassing, in, you know, in some of our circles, you know. But I think within the realm of Canadian culture, that's a tremendous affordance. And so I was just the guy on the radio who had the super long name. <laughs> uh, but one of the things you learn about being on the radio for that long is if people don't like you, they're going to let you know right away because, and I, I, I understood that from my time on the radio, that A, I'm a likable person. People like to spend time with me. That was just an empirical fact. <laughs> and B, uh, I'm an interesting person. And we all, we, we, you may think you're interesting. You may think you're likable, but you may not be entirely sure. But that time as a national broadcaster certainly gave me a higher degree of confidence. So when it was time for me to uh, pick, you know, to tell others that, no, it's, it's my turn. I, I want to tell my story. I knew that I had a level of confidence that I think um, a lot of marginalized folks don't necessarily have had the richness of experience that would mitigate their own insecurities. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, I was, uh, I was prepped really well. Sure. So in that respect, if there was uh, something you could say, get a hold of your 20 something year old self and give a shake and give a piece of advice that would land. What's something that, you know, one of our young, uh, young pals out there might really benefit in hearing. Well, this answer might be disappointing because I, but I think about this all the time. I'd say you need to start saving money. Uh, even though you're not making any money, uh, because you know, we joke about it and it's easy to, to, to dismiss that when you're a young artist, but developing your financial literacy, is really 
important because if you are any kind of, again, um, marginalized minority, for us, it's really a game of attrition in terms of there's only so many rejections, only so many times we can be ignored, only so many micro uh, aggressions we can withstand before we drop out. Mm -hmm. And one way to mitigate against that uh, is to find your collaborators, people who are like-minded. But the other way is to be smart about money. Uh, like for me, I'm really good at writing grants and that's because I'm a good writer. And so that has helped. I've heard it said that there's only two kinds of artists who are able to last. And that, and that is those who choose the entrepreneurial route. And I think that's really important to be, uh, you know, the, you, we, we all know these artists who are just very good at marketing and business and, and what have you. I'm speaking to one of them. Oh, well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was, uh, but I mean, I, I try, I'm trying to get better at it. Hmm. The other path is academic, which, hmm. you know, you get your graduate degrees and you teach, but I think that's kind of a dead end path because academia in itself is so demanding that I, I have yet to meet a theater artist who is a tenure track professor who is able to remain prolific uh, within the professional theater world. Right. Like I've known people who've gone from theater to academia but they don't come back. Hmm. All right. That's, that's a lovely piece of advice. And uh, one that we, I, as you say, are continuing to learn and continuing to develop those skills. Um, can we go a bit further back of like 10 mm -hmm. year old Tetsuro? What would be a piece of advice that, that he would really uh, appreciate hearing from you? 10 year old Tetsuro. Hmm. Well, I guess the only thing I'd say to my 10 year old self is it wouldn't be any advice in the sense that I don't think 10 year old Tetsuro should take any different path than the one he's already on that leads to present day Tetsuro. Mm -hmm. I would just say you're going to lead an interesting life and it's going to be fun. So that's something you should look forward to. A question I often ask myself at different points in my life is, uh, when I'm not sure what to do, is I give myself the deathbed test, which is when I'm on my deathbed, you know, hopefully it'll be a bed and not a piece of cardboard in an alleyway, uh, <laughs> as it's dripping down on my forehead. But if I'm on my so deathbed, dramatic. <laughs> well, I think that's for me. I really do. I, I, you think I'm being facetious, but if I feel, I feel like if I end up in a bed when I when I die. That'll be a victory because mm. I feel like uh, my path is so uncertain in terms of, you know, I have this stubborn level of integrity whereby I, I continuously refuse to do the smart thing financially and I'm always guided by curiosity. But if I end up on a bed, what would deathbed Tetsuro want me to do today? And that, of course, is always to take a risk, to be in the moment, uh, to be guided by my curiosity. And that's something I've been able to do for you know, a long time now. And I think, you know, I'm joking about the cardboard um, in, in an alleyway. And <laughs> while I realize that's a possibility, I'm not actually worried about that because I think, you know, so many of us spend so much time worrying about things that will ultimately never happen. And I think that if the deathbed versions of ourselves could come back and talk to us, our present day self, and if they told us that, look, it's, it's all going to be fine. You're going to end up, you know, you're going to be great in the end, like no matter what, believe me, um, how much more courage would we live with? How much more fearless, mm. uh, you know, would we be if we knew that, all the things we were so fretful about would never come to pass. I think we'd live larger lives. I think we'd be more generous. I think we'd be more loving. I think we'd speak a little more clearly. I think, I think we would put work out there. I think we'd be a little less afraid. And I feel like that's a knowledge for some reason or another I've always had. My 10 year old self was pretty happy. I continue mm -hmm. to be happy in some ways. I'm still very, I still very, I still, 
feel very connected to my 10 year old self. I like to think my 10 year old self uh, would like my 49 year old self uh, a lot. I think, hey, mm. you're a cool guy. Uh, I'm gonna beat you one day. Yeah, that's that's all right. <laughs> anyway, that's the fantasy. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Okay, well, let's stay in this fantasy world if we may. Yeah. And and then let's. What would forty nine year old Tetsudo say to cardboard box Tetsudo? Uh, wow. Uh, I'd say. Uh, I I think I'd say. Okay. Uh, respect. Like cardboard box Tetsuro, uh, this may not be a great moment externally, but I have to say that you ending up here must be evidence of the path not taken. Because in an alternate universe, there is a version of Tetsuro that owns a house, has a mortgage. I could have stayed at the CBC. I was staff. I could have rode that out, you know, till retirement. Mm. But you know, people are always asking me, do, do, are you sorry you left CBC? You had a great gig, you know, national radio host, you know, million, week, million weekly listeners, you know, making lots of money, uh, talking with celebrities. Mm. I'd say, I'm really glad I left because my life since then has been one adventure after another and you know, those adventures could never have been predicted. I feel like I've lived several lifetimes. So I feel like uh, I would thank the person on the cardboard soaking in the rain. Uh, I, I'd have to say that your financial dire straits may, I would take it as some kind of proof that old Tetsuro never compromised. Because I, I am at the point where, you know, I have a PhD, newly minted, 2018, and I am applying for academic jobs. And, um, you know, one piece of advice that I got from someone who also has a PhD, she said, uh, you know, a lot of creative people tell themselves, once I get tenure after seven years, then I'll revert to my radical self. And she said, uh, I've never seen it happen. Hmm. You know, once you become annexed, uh, I think that has an alchemical effect. And I don't think those people who, you know, the, the people that such a thing happens to, I don't think they're sorry. Because, you know, it's, it's been said that careers in theater last on average, I don't know, seven years, probably half of that for people of color. But there's a reason why they, they use the adjective grinding ahead of poverty. Because when I'm at the grocery store and my credit card's declined, like that's not a surprise to me. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying that to feel, you know, I'm not listening to anyone's pity, but one of the most valuable lessons I learned from art school is having comfort uh, with uncertainty and having my own self-worth not be measured by how much money I have. Uh, when you can derive your sense of self-identity from other aspects, and I think that's one of the gifts of Japanese culture, is that the values of sort of old school Japanese culture are such that you could be a very high status person and have no money at all by being you know, a scholar or an expert on historical haiku. You can have tremendous respect in the community. I think that's changing, of course. Hmm you know, in this late stage capitalism, but that's, that's a, a set of values I've, I've internalized. That I think that's so commendable and, and so brave. Uh, and it really sounds like you're, you're weighing these two, uh, these two parts of your life of, of following the call, the curiosity, and then also this, it feels like it's very rooted in financial awareness and, keeping an eye on future avenues. Well, this is a function of getting older. Uh, <laughs> how old are you, Kunji? 33. 33. I don't so know if you can see my gray hairs, out. but they're, they're coming. They're fast and furious. They come in gray. You'll uh, notice that, um, so our vantage point is, is pretty different. So you're in your early 30s. I'm in my late 40s. 
it's almost 20 years. And it's, it, it's interesting having this conversation with you because what you'll notice is on one hand, there will be more options available to you as more people become familiar with, with you and your work. Like I knew about you long before I met you because people told me about, you know, uh, there's this great artist, you need to check out his work. And I think, you know, your, your reputation will continue to, to, um, to afford you more opportunities as more people get to know you. But as you get older, you will feel the pressure of time in terms of how many productive years you have left, whereby people will pay money to see you on stage. Uh, you know, there's, there's a kind of Buddhist proverb that for the beginner, all things are possible, but for the expert, few things. So, uh, yeah, I feel like definitely the avenues, the branches that fork off in different directions, they're definitely diminishing. Um, but at the same time, some of those branches are very interesting, very enticing. They're the kind of branches people, you know, would kill for. Uh, so they're, these are high class problems I'm facing, like A, B, or C, all of those roads are glittering. But when you're in your early thirties, like there's probably an infinite number of things you could do. Not all of them glittering. Uh, no, but they could definitely <laughs> lead to really, you know, promise, promising lands, as they say. For sure. All right. Well, uh, something else I'd love to know, uh, you've accomplished quite a bit. Uh, are there, are there, like, you've had a diverse career, you've had successes in theater, success in radio, success in family. Um, is there anything still on the table for you that you know you're craving to get to? No, I mean, you characterize my so-called career very generously, but I guess as someone who is guided by curiosity, that might be a euphemistic way of saying, I have a short attention span. <laughs> so when I find something ceases to be interesting, I'll stop doing it. I've heard it said that it's not failure we must fear, but success, because the right combination of money and prestige can lock us into roles that are no longer suitable for us. And so when I walked away from, for example, writing for This Hour is 22 Minutes or uh, hosting for CBC Radio, people were always surprised because my subsequent gigs weren't you know, as well paid or as glamorous, but it's very important not to internalize the world's value and mistake them for your own. Mm. Uh, you spoke a bit about um being locked in positions that you're no longer suited for. Uh, can I ask you about as you, as I look up to you in, in terms of both career and, and somewhere I might get to, uh, to, to live to see 49 kind of thing. Uh, can you speak a bit about what it means to you to cultivate a next generation, to cultivate someone who might be more suited for roles like that? Um, something that infuriates me is those who climb to the top of the ladder and pull up the ladder behind them. Mm. I think it really behooves anyone in any industry that once you get into the so-called club, um, you need to make a beeline for the exit door in the back and wave people in. I think that's a moral obligation because anyone who gets in, it's not on talent or merit alone. It's because that person is the beneficiary of different kinds of privilege. And if you have any sort of belief in social justice, then I think it's the moral responsibility for anyone who's caught a break to help those behind you, below you, for them to get those same chances, those same opportunities. When you speak about uh, having a, earning a certain level and then entry into this club, I want to recognize that you you're very generous in recognizing the the steps up that others have given you and and the fortune you've you've found in your life. But now that you've found at least a foot in the door of this club, what's something you would do with this um, social equity 
to change the club. I was recently invited to apply for an artistic directorship here in Vancouver for one of the large theaters. Wow. And I had never considered becoming an artistic director before. It was of no interest to me. But that invitation came about a month ago. And it's interesting when you get these opportunities because as an individual artist, at my most prolific, I can do one show every other year. And collectively, the differently abled, you know, the South Asian, Asian, queer, indigenous, that's how we contribute to this discourse of equity, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation. And that's good. But if I were in a position whereby I could program six shows a year, now that's, now we're talking hmm. in terms of that could really profoundly change the ecology of, of Vancouver theater. Now, chances are I won't get this opportunity. I'm pretty certain of that. But what's exciting to me is that I have now had my eyes opened to the social potential of considering such a position. So if another position were to open, uh, another artistic directorship, whereby I would be more suited as a person of color and given my values, I would strongly consider that because it's taken this past month of imagining and ruminating for me to recognize that if one is committed to reshaping the contours of Canadian culture and affecting the course of social change, then that's a hell of a position to be in because it's a fulcrum upon which you can push really long levers to, to give people opportunities to enable culture to be more interesting by telling everyone's stories. Mm. Exciting. I mean, you got my vote. Awesome. <laughs> I hope you're on the board. <laughs> you know what? I'm not. Uh... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Like Whatever could... social equity I got, uh, it's it's backing you. Cool. Uh, I guess that's I, one of my last questions here for you. Um, what are you excited about in terms of the next generation uh, having to offer, whether it's the uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, or Japanese, Canadian specifically? What excites you about the community? Um, what really excites me about the upcoming generation of, of theater artists within our community is their degree of critical consciousness that I think was not catalyzed by Black Lives Matter, but if anything, it was just given more oxygen, more permission, more space to talk about these things. It's exciting for me to see uh, early career artists uh, standing up, speaking out, speaking truth to power. Uh, yeah, that was just, that's just the level of, of awareness that I think my generation was lacking, or at least we weren't saying those things out loud because we were always only ever the only non-white person in the room. And now things are different. I feel like we're experiencing a cultural turn towards inclusivity. And yeah, I feel like the revolution is beginning, you know, the foot soldiers are on the ground. And I'm just really thrilled that all these communities that have exist, have existed, have been scraping on an existence on the margins are, are really finding their voice. I, I can't wait to live uh, in the world that they are, are seeking to create. Mm. And hopefully I can remove some obstacles for them. Yeah, I was just going to say, if the foot soldiers are on the ground now, it's because of artists like you have helped uh, pave the way or clear the path or prepare in some way. So thank you for the work you've done so far. And it's really exciting to hear that. I mean, you got a lot left to give. And uh, once that foot is in the door, uh, I'm really excited to see uh, what else is possible through you as a, as a vessel of, of inclusivity, equity, diversity. Uh, and so thank you for the work so far and thank you for being so open and forthcoming and, and eloquent in sharing your thoughts with our audience here today. Yeah, it was my pleasure, Kunji. Uh, I really enjoyed spending time with you 
and our audience. And I see that the, the sake is all done. So yeah. <laughs> it's it been a real pleasure. It's kept me warm through the, uh, <laughs> through this time. <laughs> is there anything else uh, in closing you want to uh, share or, or loop to or, or. No, uh, other, uh, other than I, I want to give props uh, to the work that you're doing. Uh, you're a connector and you're one of the people that are enabling others to do that. So this is such important work that you're doing. And uh, I want to thank you on behalf of, of everyone. Uh, this work that you're engaging in, it lifts everyone up. So thank you. It, it's an honor. It really is to be able to, to connect with the community in this way and speak with folks like you. And I'll, I'll keep that sake warm as I'm editing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Japanese Canadian to me, Stories from the Stage, is hosted by me, Kunji Ikeda. More information about my own artistic work can be found at cloudsway.ca. My guest today was the one and only Tetsuro Shigematsu. Our opening theme and additional music is by Onibana Taiko. Sounds Japanese Canadian to Me is co-produced and presented by the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Sounds Japanese Canadian to Me, Stories from the Stage.